Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. Inspiration and hope. The rebellion was built on these things because in all honesty in those earlier days they didn't have much else to rely on. Back then, whenever they managed to gather enough ships to call themselves a fleet, they usually lost all those ships shortly after, either through their own incompetence or the competence of their pursuers. For instance, right after their victory, after the Battle of Yavin 4, the rebels would go on the audacious Mid-Rim Offensive, which would be followed shortly after by the Mid-Rim Retreat. The average rebel fighter was not taking out Star Destroyers with their X-Wing. More often than not, they were armed with little more than their courage while facing one of the most technologically advanced military forces the galaxy had ever seen. And that courage was given to the rebel fighter thanks to a very convenient lie told by their commanders that their individual sacrifice would bring liberty to the rest of the galaxy. The Rebellion would tell millions of similar lies to their soldiers until one day that lie finally became the truth. Because ideas like liberty can only manifest when enough people are willing to fight for it and believe in it. Today's video is dedicated to all of those individuals who never made it to that point. This is for the rebels who died believing that their sacrifices were pointless. A lot of people died during the Battle of Scarif. A lot of heroes, especially the ones who were part of the initial ground team, who went in all alone thinking that no one would come to their aid. But then there were those who did come. Individuals like the members of Blue Squadron, who managed to make it through the Shield Gate before it closed. They would be trapped alongside Rogue One, and they would also perish and be remembered like heroes. But then there was Vango's Grek, who had every intention to join the rest of his squadron down on the surface of Scarif. Vango's Grek had flown with the famous turf and yellow aces and had caused havoc in the mid-rim. He was no coward. But Vango's Grek was also unfortunately the 13th X-Wing that plunged through that shield gate, or at least tried to. Vango's Grek will forever be immortalized by his Wikipedia page, which documents him screaming seconds before he slammed into the shield gate as the aperture closed. He was going many times faster than the speed of sound. But at least we know his face, his name, and some of his background because the uh, X-Wing that's following him also slams into the shield gate. And we know literally nothing about him or her. The Battle of Atalan occurred early in the Galactic Civil War in 2BBY. It was a part of the larger Lothal campaign in which Chiss Grand Admiral Thrawn was sent to quell the local resistance movement growing there. It was also one of the first times we saw the feared Imperial Interdictor class Star Destroyer. This was actually Thrawn's favorite weapon back in the EU days, so it's really great to see it come back. The Interdictor Star Destroyer could project gravity wells that would show up on a starship's sensors as planetary masses. This would trigger the failsafe built into every starship and pull them out of hyperspace. Thrawn was truly a tactical genius. This was the perfect type of weapon to be used against the rebels, who liked employing hit-and-run strategies. Had the Empire deployed more of these ships in larger numbers, the Rebellion would have had serious problems operating. When Thrawn arrives in the Atalon system, he catches both Phoenix Group and the Masasi Group off guard. These two alliance to restore the Republic units represented a good portion of the Rebellion's naval power at the time. General Jan Dodonna recognizes how dangerous the situation is, and immediately orders his fleet to get out of the system. One of the Masasi Group's EF-76 Nebulon B escort frigates immediately jumps into hyperspace, but to everyone's horror, it gets pulled out back into real space almost immediately. The rebels fail to react to the situation in time, and the Imperials who were prepared for the situation quickly fired on the ship with a barrage of turbolaser fires, reducing it to scrap metal. The Nebulon B escort frigate at the time was considered the backbone of the Rebel Alliance Navy. It was one of the larger ships they had available to them. This frigate was actually originally designed as a cheaper replacement for the Imperial Time Star Destroyer and would be used in more remote regions of the galaxy. For the Masasi group to lose one of these types of ships was sort of like the Empire losing an entire Star Destroyer. It was definitely a big deal. Shaw Guerrero was always a revolutionary. Long before the Empire even rose, he was fighting against the tyranny of the separate destroyed army. But he was never a great leader. Now that role was filled by his sister, Stila Guerrera. Saw was just a weapon, a fighter and destroyer of both machine and life. Stila Guerrera, however, was much more. She was a leader of man. She knew how to inspire individuals, and she always understood what and why they were fighting for. 
But the life of a soldier is difficult, and the life of a guerrilla fighter is even more difficult. Stila would die during the Clone Wars, and Sagra would survive. He would keep fighting the Separatist Alliance, which would turn into the Empire. Years would turn into decades, and the Andoranian resistance would turn into the Partisans. Sagra became a harder and crueler man, willing to make tougher and more brutal decisions on the battlefield, and soon, the soldiers he surrounded himself with reflected those changes as well. Some say that Saw turned towards the dark because of the loss of his sister. It was my fault. I shot that gunship down, and it crashed into a position. I would say that Saw was destined for this future, and that is because a warrior who does not fight for purpose and only fights for death and destruction can only go in one direction. In the last days of his life, we see Saw Gerrera stationed on Jeddah, a world in great decay. His partisans were made up of mercenaries, criminals, rogues, rebels who wanted more action, and enemies of the Empire who wanted revenge. Saw's partisans carried out brazen attacks in broad daylight against stormtrooper patrols. They were undisciplined, careless, and disorganized. They were victorious ultimately because of their brutality, but they also suffered heavy casualties and endangered the local civilian populace during their operations. Although on a tactical level, Saw Gerrera won many victories against the Empire, on a strategic level, their gains were insignificant. And so when Tarkin and Orson Krennic bring the Death Star over Jeddah and fire, it's not even about killing the partisans. They're just an insignificant bonus for what essentially is a weapons test. Saw Gerrera is too tired to run, he watches the earth fold up before him, rising like a giant tidal wave about to swallow everything in its path. The reason Saw doesn't run is not because he has robot legs, if, if anything that would make him faster. It's more that Saw Gerrera has no place left to run at this point in his life. He's tired of fighting, and killing Imperials has never brought him the happiness or escape that death will. Jack Tano Porkins, aka Picky, was oftentimes made fun of because of his weight, but it's a stressful life being a rebel. There's a complete lack of R&R, spare parts, benefits, and also no formal uh, burials if you do, you know, croak. So if I were him, I'd be stress eating all the time. Plus, Jack Tano Porkins was no joke. He should be respected. He was formerly a tier five ace and a well-seasoned starfighter pilot and ground attack specialist. He was also a veteran of the Battle of Scarif. Porkins would fly his Red Six during the attack on the Death Star. Unfortunately, when he destroyed one of the station's shield deflector towers, Porkins was flying way too low and was hit by some debris. His wingway Big Dark Lighter Red Three saw damage on Porkins' X-Wing and advised him to pull up and disengage. Jack Porkins was a stubborn individual and believed that he could handle his severely damaged ship but he had decelerated to such an extent that one of the turbolasers on the battle station was able to track him and destroy his ship. Harrison Dula was always one of the best pilots in the entire rebellion, but it took her a while to become a good commander. In the early years of the rebellion, Sindula would lead elements of Phoenix Group on various missions with the same mentality headstrong Jedi like Anakin would. She would just lead from the front and just expect others to follow her. Which of course is a recipe for failure when you're leading a bunch of bush pilots who are piloting civilian ships with bolted on weapons and shields. On one humanitarian mission, Harrison Dula leads a squadron of corvettes against an Imperial blockade over the planet of Ibar. They need to run the blockade in order to deliver supplies to the ground. Sindula is outmatched by the Empire's light cruisers, but tries to force her way right past them. However, she doesn't try to divert their attention or outflank them. Instead, she flies right towards them, presenting an easy target. As a result, the CR-90 Corvette takes several turbolaser bolts to the cockpit at relatively close range, and it is destroyed along with all of its supplies it was carrying. Sindula would be forced to retreat as a result. Now, eventually the Rebels would come back with the prototype for what would become the B-Wing bomber and blast their way through the blockade. But I still think, as a Rebel, it would have been smarter for them to approach the situation in a less frontal assault type of way. Tivik had no idea he was a rebel. Instead, he thought he was an informant for a rebel intelligence officer, Cassian Andor. Unfortunately, intelligence officers, especially those in loosely organized and not well-supplied paramilitary organizations, are going to cut corners and do whatever it takes to get the job done. Ethics or morality be damned. Now, Tivik had some information about the defecation, defection, defecation of Bodhi Rook from the Empire. 
The pilot apparently had some important information about the Death Star project. Now, Tivik and Cassian make the mistake of having their conversation in a sketchy alley, which is really the first thing you learn not to do in Spycraft 101. If you are gonna meet in a public place, either use the cover of the crowd to hide what you're doing, or go to a quiet place that isn't a dead end. And so when a group of stormtroopers walk up on them asking for scan cards, Cassian Endor is forced to gun them down. Tivik, who has a broken arm, is unable to escape, and so Cassian Endor whispers sweet words to him and puts him down like a dog. This would have been completely avoidable if they weren't screaming at each other in a dead end at the end of an alley. In the early stages of the Galactic Civil War, the Rebel Alliance had their own version of the expendable TIE Fighter pilot, and that was the expendable A-Wing pilot. The A-Wing was ridiculously fast and perhaps too nimble for most pilots. This was all possible because the A-Wing was very light, aka had no armor, and very minimal shields. It was actually said that the shields were so useless that most pilots would just remove the entire system to save weight on their A-Wing so they could get more uh, juice out of the engines. And so yeah, A-wing pilots were really expendable. During one Phoenix mission, also led by Harrison Dula, a squadron of A-wings are deployed to scout out the Concord Don system. They want to ask the local Landos for a safe passage through the area on their way to Lothal. Upon arriving, though, her unit is intercepted by several Fang fighters. With a very little warning, once they find out who they were, the Fang fighters immediately maneuver behind the A-wing's tail. If Phoenix Squadron were better trained, they would have immediately reacted the second an unknown entity got onto their tail. Unfortunately, this doesn't happen and Phoenix 3 is instantly vaporized when the Mandalorian protectors open fire. The GR-75 medium transport is a terrible ship. It essentially is a clamshell hull with engines on it and it's not fit for transporting anything you want to keep alive for the duration of the journey. Which is exactly the type of ship that the Rebels would have to somehow modify and use for their war against the Empire. The GR-75 was famously used during the Battle of Hoth as an evacuation ship. What made it so terrible was its lack of armor, slow speed, lack of weapons, and class 4 hyperdrive. Now, for some reason, the Rebel fleet at Scarif included 12 of these starships. If I remember correctly, the Rebels would modify these GR-75s by placing four light twin laser cannons on them, but at this point, you're just putting gun ports on a minivan, which really just attracts a lot of negative attention to a ship that you don't want to attract any attention to. During the Battle of Scarif, one of the Rebels' GR-75 somehow makes it through the entire battle intact, but as it's escaping, it flies directly into Darth Vader's Devastator, which has arrived from hyperspace. And so we're just going to add bad luck to the GR-75's long list of disadvantages. When Phoenix Cell established Chopper Base in the Autolon system, they didn't really have the time or resources to thoroughly check the area for hazards. They were just happy they had found a suitable planet that wasn't being surveilled by the Empire. And so when A-Wing pilot Lieutenant Dicer callsign Phoenix 6 was on a routine mission to place a sensor beacon on the perimeter of the base, she also made first contact with some terrifying Krikna. Now in cartoon form, they might not be so terrifying, so let's just play some clips of what they look like in live action. R.I.P. Dicer. The next time the Rebels arrive to a planet that can host, like, local wildlife, they should bring a squad of Rebels armed with flamethrowers to take care of the local flora and fauna. What happened to Lieutenant Dicer here was some Star Trek red shirt ground team kind of nonsense. It should not be happening in Star Wars. Captain Mika Ivan, callsign Hal, was the heart of Twilight Company. This was a unit that probably saw more combat than any other Rebel infantry unit during the war. Like many of the greatest combat leaders in history, Captain Ivan was rumored to be a teacher before being an officer. What made Captain Ivan so special was his personal ideology, which he tried to teach to his junior officers and NCOs. Our goal isn't conquest, but alchemy, the transmutation of the galaxy. We are a catalyst. Where rebellion comes into contact with the Empire, change must occur. The substance of oppression becomes a substance of freedom. And as with any change, terrible energies are released. War, victory, and defeat. Captain Yvonne realized that Twilight Company would have a very difficult war ahead of it. As a matter of fact, throughout the entire war, Twilight Company would suffer way over 100% casualties. At certain points of time, Twilight Company only had enough manpower to fill one functional platoon. 
The captain understood all of this. He knew that no matter how efficient and clever they were on the tactical level, they still wouldn't be able to do too much direct damage to the Empire. What Twilight Company needed to survive was an ideology and belief system to guide through the war, one that would ultimately even out-survive him. In this way, Captain Yvonne was the opposite of Saw Guerrero. Twilight Company's goal wasn't to kill as many Imperials as possible. Its goal was actually to inspire others, including Imperials, to rise up and fight against Emperor Palpatine. Captain Yvonne, who had survived countless battles, ultimately lost his life on a mundane mission back to Rebel Headquarters on Hoth. Yvonne unfortunately arrived on Echo Base when he was being assaulted by Darth Vader. No one really understands how he died, but during the bombardment of the base, he apparently sustained some pretty bad wounds and eventually bled out because of a lack of medical treatment. Leaders like Mika, Ivan, and Mon Mothma kept the rebellion focused on the only goal they could hope to achieve. It wasn't a tactical goal or the destruction of the Death Star, but the goal to convince the galaxy that their fight was winnable and just. So there you have it guys, 10 examples of rebels losing their lives. Whether these deaths were pointless or not is up to you guys to decide, but I'm pretty sure that a lot of these individuals right before they died thought it was indeed a pointless death. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe, hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, my name is Alan, and my allegiance is to the Republic through democracy.